So in this first little bit, I'm going to talk about what we accomplished, and then stop and ask you what kind of questions you have, and then I'll continue on more, whatever your questions are. So I'm just going to brag for a little while about what we accomplished, and then you can figure out if, what you want to know about that. Does anybody have direct experience with the superbugs? I know there's some hospital. Yeah. How, how am I doing so far? Yeah. I'm a non, uh, you know, I management guy, no experience. I walk onto an ICU. They look at me like, you're in the wrong place, dude. Unless you're sick, you shouldn't be here. Get away. Right? We, we do serious work here. So uh, I'm talking really, I'm going to combine into a single story three different multi site case studies, two in the United States and one across Canada and uh, Latin America. So uh, these are the typical results that happened everywhere we worked uh, in all of those countries and all of those sites. That uh, the, the smallest number of improvement was a 40% decrease in the transmission down to a number of places that I, I had the privilege of working where it was zero. There were no more transmissions over a, a couple year period. Right? So that's a pretty good improvement rate on something that everybody thought was impossible. Uh, to change. And so, uh, up in Canada, it's a foreign country, did you know that? Uh, and it's a socialist foreign country. So when they do a, any kind of project, it would be a lean project too, they'd say, well, we want to change the culture and solve the problem. Right? So that's, they had some of this as an idea. So what we were able to do, and this is Michael Gardam, he's a doctor, he was one of the key physicians in the Toronto area when SARS arrived and it really hit Toronto and Canada quite hard. It was a, another one of these terrible um, uh, kind of epidemics. And so he learned some lessons and he wanted to start this Canada-wide project. We did it, we got the results like that. I just showed you. And um, the biggest surprise for him, and not so much for me, because this is what I think liberating structures do. We solved the problem by um, my with these microstructures, we change the pattern of how people work together. The fundamental, most essential pattern at the smallest scale. And as a result, uh, the problem is solved. And because there's success, there's proof to everybody in that unit or that was involved in that, that it works. Right? There's social proof that it works and clinical proof. And so what we noticed immediately is uh, that started to spread from unit to unit. And when we did interviews afterward, we noticed that uh, the typical hospital pattern, which is a stat, get it done, very action-oriented, not too much reflection on things, not, it, it's a particular kind of culture, that it shifted because they had success with this work. Right? And, uh, and I'm going to describe a little bit what that is. So here he's saying the big surprise was, yeah, we got the results, and we changed the way people work. Uh, this 40 to 100 uh, percent reduction impressed things. And uh, for him, who's a pretty hard-nosed doctor, he starts saying, well, what's the next big impossible challenge I can take on? Right? Sort of, sort of, uh, it was quite stunning for me to hear him, him say this, that he now he kind of likes to ride the, the big wave whatever the new big impossible thing might be. Um, and I'm going to talk a little bit more about him, him later. So um, let's see. I don't want to do anything else there. I think I want to bring this break right there. Um, blathered for a little bit. And we're going to use one liberating structure right now to generate some questions. And it's called one, two, four, all. So here are a few of the liberating structures I'm going to mention. And with it, they used not a formula. Uh, not used in every place, uh, but these are the variety of things that got used some places and were more effective there than others. So it's very localized, but all of these are quite simple to learn. So the whole repertoire is 33 plus five or six more that are in development since we wrote a book. And so this is what they all look like. They have, each has an icon uh, because we developed them in uh, Latin America and Europe and other places where English was not that good. Um, so this is a little handful. I'm still answering the formula. Was there a formula? These are the handful that we found to be effective in this work, uh, preventing the spread of uh, superbugs. So I'm going to go through a little bit more about what the liberating structures are. 
I think I just said most of this, but it's little changes in the protocol. So a protocol is I give the whole talk and then you ask some kind of limp questions at the end because you're bored by that. Right? And you have somebody has a question, or there's no time for questions even. So this change in the protocol. Okay, you're directly involved at the beginning. A small thing, but it makes a huge difference. And uh, they can be in how you meet, how you make decisions, um, really how you're relating to each other, so that each person has a voice and shapes what happens next. So each of these little things, they may seem like an icebreaker when you first do them, or you think, but they have some attributes that are kind of different. So they're nearly expertless. You are now authorized. If I had a colored belt, I'd give it to you. <laughs> to do one, two, four, all. No further training required. Right? And all of them, there's a few that take a little more courage to put them out there, but uh, they're expertless. Uh, they create a, a very specific result. So I just got the kinds of things I'm going to address. You know, it helped helping me shape what the presentation is. Uh, they go very quickly. So the one, two, four, all, it's 10 minutes. If you do it longer, it doesn't make it better. It makes it worse. So it's fast cycling. They're usually fun. You guys were laughing and goofing and engaged. Um, very inclusive. Nobody's left out. Each person starts, generates their own idea, their own question. Uh, Multi-scale. Uh, work regularly with thousands of people in the room, or hundreds. Makes no difference that you use the same methodology. Uh, they spread themselves. It goes from, if you get success and you get the proof, it spreads itself. Because it's so simple. And it's modular. It's an infinite recombining of the individual liberty structures. That's modularity. It's, it's a cool thing. So the, those are the things. The other idea that we are working with, it isn't so much a methodology. It's called positive deviance. And the idea here is that in every, whatever, however desperate your problem is, there's somebody in the population that's experiencing it that has behaviors that at least in part solve the problem. So it wasn't as if everyone wasn't washing their hands, that everyone wasn't abiding by uh, isolation precautions, you know, don't go in this room without a gown and glove. It wasn't that everybody um, uh, wasn't swabbed, you know. There were some people and some places where that existed, and that's where we started. So somebody had a question about that, is that we didn't go in and say, we were all the bad, this is the history of why this failed. Because you go in and you, you try to find the bad actors. You didn't wash your hands, but we counted. You know, we counted as they walked in the room. We're going to have a poster, we're going to have a laminated poster on every wall saying, wash your hands. Um, why is it so hard to do all the time? So we, you admit that it's hard. This is where we start. You know, go to where they are, not from some office, and we don't try to bribe them or influence them. Uh, well, do you know anybody who just effortlessly solves this problem all the time? What do they do? How do they do it? Get any ideas? What first step did we take to act on those ideas? And this is just inviting them to invent, find and invent solutions. Um, does anybody actually want to do anything? I don't ask that early on or it won't get anywhere at all. Uh, and then who else should be involved in our next meeting? Our next try to do something about this? Right? So that's what I mean by ownership, and you go right, you study at the feet of the people who do the work. Now, I know that's close to some lean principle, I'm sure it is. Right? Uh, so you're going to like this. Uh, so these are a couple things, uh, in addition to Canadians, I will say bad things about best practices, and buy-in, and any kind of deficit-based approach. Uh, if you need technical analytic training, you're probably not going to be able to influence a lot of people. Um, the idea that you need to go away and get some leadership poured into you and then you'll come back and be better, it's nonsense. You're perfect as you are. And um, I already said that. And so the, the thing that we're doing is uh, we focus on self-discovery in the groups of people that are doing the work. Um, down up and inside out work. Um, what's working here? Who's making progress? Simple, simple methods always uh, that anybody can do and learn. And um, we invite uh, ownership. So I'm going to skip this. I think you're going to get it. I guess the main thing to say here is that uh, if you do it that other way, it's very controlling 
and the behavior you get is is very much dependency. Let's wait and see what the manager or the, the leader wants. And um, it's just it doesn't encourage it doesn't move. Right? It's so like, it's kinda of like that guess what I think the answer is. You know, the, the manager you go to is like Well and that's usually wrong and you have to rework it yeah, and it goes yeah. back and forth, back and forth. <laughs> so we're trying to let go of that, focus on the engagement, get real clear about the purpose. We're here to stop the transmission of superbugs. We're coming onto your unit to learn from you how you do that. And what you don't aren't already doing, we'll invent something with you. Or you'll invent it. We won't. I didn't invent it. Um, and so we're encouraging self-organization. Blah, 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 blah. So this old um, saying that the great leader is, is he of whom the people say, we did it ourselves. That's what we're shooting for. And um, so this Canadian, Michael Gardam, yeah, these are the results of his study. There were six sites. I worked with a couple of them, one in British Columbia in particular. And so the traditional is this doer, evidence-based practice, information, and data are trusted. Uh, uh, cultural change is very complicated. You have to spend years doing it. Um, uh, leaders need to step up and take charge. Uh, top-down leadership um, from traditional leaders. So here, this is what emerged. And these two very dis different uh, cultures were operating simultaneously in the places, and this is what they noticed. Um, take time for discovery and inventing things. Um, practice-based evidence making. So that's the flip side. Where do you think evidence-based practice comes from? Practice-based evidence making comes from work boots on the, on the boots on the ground, and some of it is very localized. So we're saying one can't exist without the other, and it's a mantra. You just, for me, those two always go together. Uh, stories are trusted. Relationships uh, change is simple. Leaders need to step back most of the time. Maybe they just provide resources. And um, bottom, you can start as you give more freedom to the front line. They take more responsibility. Woohoo! Is the response of the leaders. Eventually, if they can handle it. The idea here, one of the complexity science ideas, is 15% solutions. So none of us have, and I think this might be a concept in me too, 85% of the system is outside of our control. But 15% is the discretion and influence we have available. So we encourage that uh, quite a bit. And here's Michael Garden saying, uh, uh, how wonderful it is, uh, ideas, frontline people have, they, they take action immediately, people see their own ideas spread. So that's the way it sustains itself. And I want to give you one example here, I'm going to move forward. Uh, this guy Jasper, here he is. So one of the little things that happens that makes it hard to do this work, which we discovered and by asking those questions, I said, you know, what makes it hard to, to do the safe things all the time? Well, um, in a lot of the rooms in Einstein Medical Center in Philadelphia, uh, there'd be these big piles of leftover gowns. And it was, you know, and, and the clinicians, nurses and doctors would be looking at the room and they'd kind of go, I'm just going to go in there and do that one thing that I need to do and I won't touch anything. Which as soon as you're in there, it's over. You know, you've, you're, it's over. So he is a, a transporter, you know, moves stuff around, um, and somebody sees him, uh, how he takes off a gown. He's like a he's like an artist the way he does. He's he's got these great limbs and uh, you know he spins it off and it rolls it down the final arm and it comes out in a little ball, drops it in the trash can. He's like instant. This is a fifteen percent solution. So he just went around and. Showed people how to do it. Well, the rate of gowning and gloving in isolation rooms went way up. Now, this is a very small thing. It's a 15% solution. So we invited a lot of those kinds of things.